Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. Peter Rosenblatt. I'm the director of urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery at Mount Auburn Hospital. As you may know, Medtronic has introduced two new products to its portfolio, making it the only company with choice of rechargeable or recharge-free devices. So what does that mean for us as physicians and healthcare providers? That's what we are here to talk about today. We've brought together a panel with two of the Medtronic experts who have been deeply involved in developing the new products, as well as myself and Dr. Jennifer Clausche. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Today, we're going to learn about differences in the two new products and the procedural nuances. We're going to delve into the practical side of MRI full body eligibility. Specifically, we're going to talk about MRI parameters and patient safety. And we're going to talk about patient selection for recharge free and rechargeable devices. First, let's do a brief overview of the features of the two new products in case you are not already familiar with them. The Interstim is the same device many of you know and love that's been implanted in more than 325,000 patients. What's new is that it now has SureScan MRI technology that allows 1.5 and 3T full body MRI eligibility. The Interstim Micro is Medtronic's new rechargeable device. It's the smallest one on the market and features overdrive battery technology and SureScan technology with full body MRI eligibility. Okay, let's dive in and meet our panel. All right, I'd like to welcome our panelists uh, and I'd like them to introduce themselves. We'll start with uh, Dr. Clausche. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jennifer Clausche. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a consultant at Academic Urology and Urogynecology of Arizona, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, I'm Nathan Johnson. I'm a, a principal systems engineer here at Medtronic, working on new product development for pelvic health systems, and also happy to be here. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Lauren Tran. I am part of the Applied Physics and Modeling group at Medtronic, and um, I'm here to discuss some of the MRI aspects with the new SureScan systems. All right, well, thanks everyone for agreeing to be on the panel. Uh, I think we'll start with Nathan. Nathan, if you can give us uh, just some information about what the changes are to the, for the from an in engineering standpoint, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So what we've, uh, recently released is, is really two completely new systems, and it's a lot of the same tools and processes that um, you're accustomed to, uh, but we have made some incremental improvements that will really improve your workflow. There is difference in the new batteries that we're coming out with. There's Interstim 2, and now there's Interstim Micro. And Interstim Micro is now the smallest neuromodulation device out there at 2.8 cubic centimeters. There's also some, some really impactful technology that we've included as part of our overdrive battery. And so what that means is that the battery will experience no fade at 15 years. Patients will be able to recharge for 20 minutes once a week. If they choose to let their battery go to zero, they can recharge from zero to 100% in less than one hour. And if patients do choose to take an extended break from their therapy, they can restart at any time with no significant impact to the battery. We've also come out with some new technology in our leads. In order to develop the smallest neurostimulator, we had to shrink the contact spacing. So we do have a tighter contact spacing and a new lead that goes with it. And there's also a new lead for the Interstim 2 system. And now both of those systems will be full body MR conditional. We've also made some improvements on the technology and our manufacturing. So single injection molding at the distal end, and then some improvements on the perk extension. So the percutaneous extension used for the advanced evaluation. Now that d no longer requires a boot and there's a single set screw instead of four. So it should really help streamline um, your procedure. And so Nathan, I understand the packaging has also changed? Yes, that's correct. So now we've put everything that you need for the procedure in the lead kit. So for example, you don't have to get a separate box for the needles or a separate box for the introducer because those are all now included um, in the lead kit itself. 
Well, I, I'm I'm sure my OR staff is going to really appreciate that, actually. I hope so. Um, another difference is that um, over the years, we've really learned that an overwhelming um, majority of our implanters prefer the bent tip stylet. And so now what we've done is that bent tip stylet is preloaded in the lead, so you no longer have to swap out a straight stylet for a bent one um, before implanting. Can I tell you, Nathan, that that, that, that is music to my ears personally. Uh, I think that the, the residents and the fellows like to watch me struggle taking the straight stylet out and trying to find that little, that little hole, which I noticed when I turned age 40, I could no longer see that little hole. So that, that's, that's really a great news. Nathan, I, I think it's also important for us to point out that um, you know, mo most of us have gone to the, the curved stylet uh, because it, 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 you know, uh, it seems to track along the, the nerve from, you know, from medial to lateral, whereas the straight stylet uh, didn't always track so well. So moving to that curved stylet made a huge difference. I know in my practice, a lot of people's practice, in, in getting better uh, contact between the, the, uh, the four electrodes and, and the nerve so that we could, didn't have to have such high amplitudes. And Dr. Klausche, I understand you, you've done some of these procedures with the, the bike row? Yes, um, I have going? had an opportunity to do a couple of them so far. And um, I've really been um, quite impressed because Overall, the, the technique doesn't vary much from what we know from you know, the, the basic type of unit that we've been using from Medtronic, but the biggest difference obviously has to do with the size of the rechargeable uh, device. And uh, that's definitely uh, one of the uh, main components that you have to take into account when you're setting up to do these procedures because as, as you know, when we put the standard battery in that, that we've had, it's quite a bit larger and uh, most of us are used to making you know, a, a standardized incision and going through the same process. And as surgeons, we often replicate those steps uh, you know, very consistently. And now we have to take one extra step to think about ahead of time whether or not we're gonna be using a, a smaller battery or the standard size. And um, that's been the main, the main difference. It seems like uh, the rest of the components have been uh, very similar. Um, the size of the incision itself, and then of course the depth that the, uh, the battery will be placed. So no, I think that's, that's a, those are really good points. Um, can you point out though, uh, talk to the, the difference in the pocket that you make in terms of the depth, the length of the incision, maybe the direction of the incision, anything else that's changed for you? I'm basically putting them in the same location or very similar location um, that I had before. Um, and so overall, the, the, the same basic location applies. However, given the fact that the, the battery is much closer to the size of a stick of gum, I, I believe that it was quote, quoted to be around you know 2.8 cubic centimeters, um, my incisions have probably been cut in half in terms of the overall length. Um, in terms of the depth itself, because it's a rechargeable device, um, it is recommended that it be a little bit closer to that uh, superficial you know, skin edge as opposed to in the deeper adipose and fascial layers uh, where the standard battery would be placed. So those two um, issues uh, you know, force us as surgeons to sort of just think a little bit ahead of time about, again, the size and the length of the incision, then also, you know, the, the overall depth that we need to be placing these. Uh, my uh, Medtronic rep and I have a routine prior to uh, when we're going to make that incision to stop and pause for a moment and, and look at each other and say rechargeable or non-rechargeable. And that way we know ahead of time what size incision to make. So just for, for practical purposes, is the device which like you said, a stick of gum or like a thumb drive, is it, is it lying more horizontally or is it more vertically on the patient? I've been placing mine mostly vertically. Um, and, uh, but, but uh, again, that allows you know, me to have a smaller width of the incision. Um, it allows me in kind of a natural sort of uh, place where I've been uh, locating the battery, which is on the inferior portion of the incision, to sort of just do a gentle, uh, you know, uh, blunt dissection to get into the layer that I want to get into. Um, and uh, it seems to be sitting really nicely there. Um, if, if I needed to, um, certainly I could, you know, dissect out more laterally into that tissue and, and place it the other direction. But uh, I think the vertical seems to make the most sense. And, uh, 
Uh, I haven't had any patient feedback at this point that that's, there's been a problem, but certainly um, I'm open to learning. And, and if uh, there's any evidence that comes along that that should be different, I'm, I'm completely open to changing that. So Dr. Klausche, I'm uh, interested to hear what you've noticed about the feel of the lead so far. The lead itself, to me, hasn't changed a whole lot again in, in the core, except for the two components where it's already um, got the, the curved component, which is excellent because I was using those, you know, 99% of the time anyways. Um, now at the very top of the lead, there is that directional guide on there, um, that is a little bit different. Um, and, um, I've been learning a little bit more about that as I've been able to do more procedures. Um, and, uh, with that directional guide, uh, it does help visual visualize or locate, uh, the direction that the, the curve is going. And so for some people, some Im implanters, they may be able to use that to assist, um, in placement, uh, to angle it, you know, by 10 degrees or 30 degrees and not have to completely, you know, use their, their memory or their, uh, their mind to visualize that because that, that directional, uh, component is on there now. That's great. Do you have any closing thoughts about the procedure? Well, I really think that overall, it's been a very easy transition, uh, you know, into the new technology that's available. You know, Medtronic has done a great job at making sure that the, the same basic uh, technology uh, that we're all familiar and comfortable with, the same techniques are all in place so that, you know, we can uh, use a, a much of what we know as our foundation uh, to get a good implant, you know, in, uh, applied uh, is available to us. But the additional technology and the options for the patient um, have really, I think, made the procedure a little bit more efficient and also has given us a bigger you know, window of opportunity um, to, to uh, invite patients to have this therapy. So overall, I've been very, very pleased. I'm excited to learn a little bit more as I go and as I get more experience implanting these. Uh, it'd be fun to have a conversation fast forward a year from now when we've done you know, another 25 to 50 implants. Thank you, Dr. Klausche. That's really nice to hear. Okay, let's let's shift a little bit, and we'll, we're going to talk about the uh, the MRI compatibility. You know, we mentioned that uh, now the uh, both the micro and the interstim two uh, have the SureScan uh, technology, so that they are safe uh, for you know 1.5 and 3T eligibility. Uh, so I know Lauren, you've been uh, very involved in the development of this, and maybe you can kind of expand upon that. Let us know uh, what Medtronic has introduced. Yeah, definitely. Um, so our, our SureScan technology has been used since 2008 for um, pacemakers and for spinal cord stimulators. Um, and of course, we've also made patient safety a real priority in all of that time since then. Um, so particularly because you can imagine in the cardiac space or when you're dealing with the spinal column, those are very, very sensitive areas. And um, having a high safety bar is just it's non-negotiable when you're dealing with those parts of the body. Our, our goal when writing the MRI labeling for an implantable device is to really balance patient access um, because this is something critical for patients. The diagnostic value, the diagnostic ability of the scan itself, you want good quality scans. And then the third part of that balance is patient safety. Lauren, I think this is so important. You know, we've I've been doing interest in uh, since 1997 and over the years, it hasn't happened that many times, but there have been a number of patients where I have had to remove the interest stems so that they could have an MRI. And that and, and some patients have been hesitant to get uh, the interest stem in the first place, just because there was a possibility they may have an MRI in the future, not even knowing. So this to me is, this is a game changer, right? So this, this takes away that question altogether. So it's a, a non-issue, as you say, anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very, very excited about that. So I, I am definitely interested in learning a little bit more about some of the uh, new technology specifications and understanding how that applies to uh, patients uh, in terms of whether or not there are any limiting factors that I need to be aware of to counsel my patients. And I, I'm curious to hear if there's any differences between what uh, you've done with the technology versus the competitor's uh, technology that's out there. So in an MRI, there are two ways 
to specify controls on the radio frequency power, the RF power. There is what we chose, B1 RMS, and then there's a, uh, another one called SAR, which you may have heard of. So SAR is only one piece of a puzzle. Our team picked this thing called B1 plus RMS as our primary safety number because it is an exact measure of how much radio frequency power the patient is being exposed to when they're having their scan done. SAR, on the other hand, is an estimate. It depends on things like the patient weight and a number of other variables. And we chose to use that exact number, which depends only on the machine itself. And is, it's just essential when you're doing safety analyses to make sure that you have the best information possible and the most correct information possible. So Lauren, it, it really is hard to make a direct one-to-one -one comparison between B1 plus RMS and SAR, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is really difficult to directly compare them because there are a number of additional things that you need to know to compute SAR. But if, you're, if a patient is being scanned and the radiologists are following our primary label, our, our B1 value, the SAR may exceed the number that's in the labeling, but that does not present a safety risk because you are following our primary uh, preferred exact number, B1 RMS. And it's, in fact, the FDA themselves changed the rules in 2010 for MRI manufacturers, requiring that they display both SAR and B1 to the radiologists. They know that this, it's a really important safety metric. It's an important value to know. And so it makes sense that as, you know, 2010 gets sadly farther and farther away and more and more old machines are being retired, um, B1 is, is coming on the scene and is more likely not going to be the primary way that safety assessments are done in MRIs. So I've got a question for you. So I, I have patients who may need like an MRI of a, of a specific part of the body, like, like their knee. Does the, la does the new labeling accommodate that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the SureScan technology allows best in class uh, head imaging for the head and neck. Um, and we know that a large percentage of scans are done of the brain, say, you know, stroke or cancer or what have you. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we would get the best possible image types um, of, that, of that area. In addition, we know that a large percentage of patients may often need scans of uh, musculoskeletal regions, of your knee, of your ankle, you know, you twist something or you have a fall. Um, and so we, as an MRI team, did additional work to demonstrate that something called an extremity coil, so a coil that is focused to one of those extremity regions, um, is also compatible and safe with our implant. So Dr. Rosenblatt and Dr. Klausche, does that help address some of the questions you might have had about MRI and SureScan technology? Well, you know, I, I, I'm realizing now that I only have an MD and not a PhD, and this is way over my head, but, I, but I'm, very, I'm very reassured by what you said, that um, th this is something that's gonna resonate with patients when they ask me about, mm -hmm. uh, about MRI technology, so thank, thank you. Yes, and thank you for help clarifying that. You did lose me at the B and the SARS component, but at least the take home message I understood was that patients will have accessibility to the MRIs and even you know, as the technology continues to develop, uh, that's something that we can really reassure our patients uh, in, when they're asking these questions. Hey, uh, Nathan, um, I, do, I do understand that also there's some new technology uh, and engineering that have gone into how the leads are made. Can you, can you expand upon that somewhat? Yeah, definitely. So in the MRI environment, um, in some scans, the lead can actually act um, like an antenna. And what it will do is it will pull that RF energy um, from the MRI scan and it'll absorb it and then it will distribute it. So what we've done now with our new leads is we've added um, a tantalum braid and tantalum is a, is a kind of metal and we've formed it into a, a mesh pattern and incorporated that into our lead design. And what that does is it takes that RF energy and it distributes it along the entire lead body rather than those electrodes. And because of that, it's a much larger surface area and any localized heating effects are um, really diminished. Oh, that's, that's, that makes a total sense. Thank, thank you, Nathan. Um, I also understand, Lauren, um, that with the new technology, with the lead, there is no need for um, impedance checks. Is that, is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. Um, when a patient goes to have their MRI performed with this new um, InterSTEM devices, the remote application is it's a really simple way to switch MRI mode on and off. So the patient would then switch to MRI mode, which basically turns the device off. And then when their scanning is complete, they can deactivate MRI mode, which then turns their therapy right back on. Well, that that sounds that sounds great. Very very simple. Um, any any other you know final thoughts uh, in this in this subject? At Medtronic, we we prioritize patient safety, um, and we're really proud that over you know, 2 million SureScan devices have been implanted in patients for those other therapies. And, you know, we haven't had a safety concern. In our work for this new SureScan system with InterStim, our team did um, simulations of 10 million patient scans. That means a lot of, a lot. We did 10 million patient scans um, that was coming out of a data set of 1.2 million different scanning scenarios. And all of that was in effort to prove that there was less than a one in a million risk of injury to our patient. So hopefully all of those very large numbers really do drive home how hard we worked and um, how much of a priority patient safety is at Medtronic. All right, that was a great discussion. Why don't, why don't we change gears a little bit and, and talk about, you know, both patient education and patient selection? You know, now that we have two choices, right? We have the, we have the rechargeable and then the, the recharge free that we've been using for many, many years. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd love to hear people's thoughts about how we educate patients about this and how we have that discussion with patients about what they want to choose. I can tell you, maybe it's because uh, I've been doing this a long time and I'm, I'm trying not to uh, show my own bias about this, but I think if it were me, if I were in the sh wearing the patient's shoes, I think it's just easier personally to go with a recharge free device. Um, I think it may be my personality. I just don't want to have to think about, I want to you know fix it and forget about it for you know whatever, five years, seven years, but I know there are other people that might feel differently. But, you know, Dr. Klausi, uh, you've had this discussion with your patients. What has that discussion been like? Yeah, so it's really uh, opened up the conversation more, obviously, than when we didn't have an option. Um, it was a little bit more straightforward to counsel the patients. And, and I have to remind myself, since it is fairly new, uh, to uh, start thinking about how we're going to have that discussion and, and the timing of when we'll have that discussion. Uh, and one thing I've learned very quickly in, in terms of having these discussions with patients is uh, just never assume. Um, I have, uh, you know, a population that ranges from anywhere from 30 year olds who need um, the treatment all the way up into patients in, you know, their mid 80s. Um, and the people that I thought may want to have one type of device or the other have actually turned out to be opposite in many uh, instances. And so I really have uh, just tried to introduce it in a way that makes it simple for them to think about, is this something that I want to set it and forget it um, with the pros and cons listed un under that section? Or is it something that I want to put maybe a little bit of work and effort into and spend some time interacting with the device? and you know, perhaps get a little more battery time. Um, but really it's been um, surprising to me which patients would choose it. So I've just taken the approach of introducing both options. One thing I have realized is that there is a subset of patients who maybe physically uh, may not be able to easily manipulate, you know, a belt or, uh, you know, get a strap on themselves or might have dexterity issues. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, maybe have a patient who, uh, again, mentally doesn't have the capacity uh, to really um, put one more thing on their plate and think about that every week. So if I get that sense uh, from the patient's history or their physical, uh, then I may lean in one direction or the other just to not, uh, you know, overwhelm them with with all of these options. Uh, because at the at the end of the, the day, we really want to provide them with, um, you know, the therapy and make it as simple as possible for them. I, I, I agree with you. I think you have to think about their uh, cognitive function. Do they have, you know, a, or a caretaker who will look after this and remind them. I, I did find out recently that the patient's can opt to get like a text message to remind them uh, that they need to recharge. Well, I think it's a great idea is to use this new technology 
to remind patients so it doesn't put all of the onus on them to remember to recharge. But that would be my biggest fear, that we'd have patients who just kind of forget, and we'd have batteries that have gone down to nothing, and, and then it wouldn't be effective. Uh, but, I, but I think this is the important discussion that we have to have with, with patients. The one reassuring aspect that I really um, enjoyed hearing about when, when I you know, learned about this technology is even if the, the battery completely goes dry, there's really no issues. We can just put the recharger back on and start all over. And I think that that's a really important point because even as you know, physicians, as we're learning this process, and even if patients have well-meaning, you know, um, you know, intentions and then just forget or get busy with life. And so they just let it, you know, um, go down. Uh, we have that option of just saying, okay, no big deal. Just put it back on the charger and let's start the therapy where we left off. Well, this, this has been a great discussion. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Klausi, uh, Nathan, Lauren, thanks for all your input. This has been really valuable information and, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there, but thanks again for all your input. In closing, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us today. I hope we've answered some of your questions. If you'd like to continue the conversation or have more questions, the Medtronic team will be available at their virtual booth on October 9th and 10th. So check out the program for the times. Be sure to visit if you have any questions. Medtronic is also providing a number of resources for you attached to this virtual theater and in the virtual booth. It's an exciting time for us as healthcare providers in the urogynecology field to be able to have all these options to help patients with the debilitating disease states our patients face. I've been delighted to be part of the Medtronic faculty and work with this team to introduce these new products and their Interstim Future Without Limits initiative.